Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor. We're pleased to welcome Thomas Gratton this evening in support of the recent East and in conversation with Lillian Lee. The chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase the recent East from Literati. There is also a link to purchase books from Literati uh, in the description right below me if you're watching us later on YouTube. But if you're watching us live, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion of tonight's event using the Q&A feature available to you at any time. And I will read a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. Uh, as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And as a reminder, if you want to purchase Thomas's novel or any other books from us tonight, if you're watching live, our credit card processor is being transferred over to uh, a new one on, a, on our website. So our uh, to do that, we have to shut down web sales at 9 p.m. Eastern time this evening. So if you want to make a purchase, you'll have an hour from when we wrap up here uh, until we shut things down. And then it'll open up again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. Whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on when and where in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Thomas Gratton's short fiction has appeared in several publications, including one story, Slice, in the Colorado Review, has been shortlisted for a Pushcart Prize and was listed as a notable stories in Best American Short Stories. He has an MFA in fiction writing from Brooklyn College and has taught middle school English for more than a decade. He lives in New York City. The Recent East is his first novel. And Lillian Lee is the author of the novel Number One Chinese Restaurant, which was an NPR Best Book of 2018 and long listed for the Women's Prize and the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. Her work has been published in the New York Times, Granta, One Story, Bon Appetit, Travel and Leisure, The Guardian, and Jezebel. Originally from the DC metro area, she lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, they can't hear you, but they can sense you through the power of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Thomas Gratton and Lillian Lee into your living rooms. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the, the novel to start. So, um, so I'm reading from the beginning of the third chapter. So I'll just give a tiny bit of background information uh, before I start reading. Um, so the recent East is the story of a woman named Beata Haas, uh, who um, was in the first chapter as a 12 year old defected uh, from East Germany with her parents and they left a house behind. And then um, the following chapters um, moved to the early 90s where um, after the fall of the wall, the house is returned to her. And she um, at this point is living in the United States, um, recently divorced with two teenage kids. and. Um, she and the kids decide to actually return and um, move back to the house that she left behind. And um, for all of them, it's a really, uh, it's a really different experience. Um, her daughter Adela sort of becomes this hermit and doesn't really leave the house and she feels sort of traumatized by it. And also Beata really, it feels like an unrecognizable place. So she also, um, so, so she also really struggles with it. Michael, who is her 14 year old son, um, has a very different experience. Um, and um, so I'm gonna read from the first chapter really focusing on him and his experience um, in this city of Kritzhagen, it, which is on the Baltic coast in the former East Germany. Chapter three. In that first German week, Michael experienced more new things than he could keep track of though vandalism and drinking until his center of gravity shifted top the list. He leaned against a wall at a party held in a barracks that a year before had required security clearance, a place that had housed Soviet troops that no longer existed in a country that no longer existed either. A dozen of his new friends moved through its halls, decorating every clean surface with spray paint. 
Michael was in the midst of a message about George Bush when Lena turned to ask if he was schwul. He'd known Lena for four days. Already she felt as essential as a kidney. Schwul is gay, Michael asked. Lena was his first cool friend. His friends back in the States loved novels about the prairie. They joined clubs about government and French. Lena nodded. Behind him, someone filled a wall with a message about the fascist who worked at the grocery store. Yes, Michael answered. Lena put a hand on his arm and squeezed. He asked Lena how to say kidney in German and they both started laughing. Michael so stoned his cheeks felt numb. Lena was striking, mean looking. She wore large shirts that failed to hide the fact that she had an enormous chest. Michael spray painted a kidney on the wall and her face returned to the flat expression Michael most associated with communism, along with the cheap cabinets he found in the empty houses he went into and the shapes of people's glasses. In the next week, each of them would spray paint kidneys on buildings for the other to find. When Michael passed on his way to the store or the sea, breath thrummed against his ribs like the beating of wings. Lena found a room that was once a bathroom, toilets pulled from it like rotten teeth, only holes left. She crouched into one of those holes and peed. Still schwul, Michael said when she returned. They wandered into a room bisected by candles. It carried the same musty coolness Michael used to associate with basements though now it brought to mind the house the German lady had inherited where she was hibernating at that very moment where Adela read by flashlight. Someone brought a boombox. With the antenna angled just so, a university station from Lübeck came through. A song started. People tried and failed to sing along. Michael found this funny. His sister often accused him of finding too many things funny as if it were something to monitor, like binge eating or a tropical storm. Now that you're full, we can mess with them, Lena said, eyeing a crew of young men standing against the opposite wall. Lena leaned on his shoulder, combed her fingers through his hair. Being touched felt amazing, and Michael worried that he wasn't full after all, but just needed to be touched in a certain way. But then he thought of Darren Cross, their neighbor back in Glens Falls, the cutoff shorts he always wore loose across his hips. Michael stopped that train of thought when he started to get hard. Kidney, Lena whispered. Still schwul, Michael said. His Glens Falls version would have thrown up had someone asked if he were gay, would have been too afraid of these barracks to have slipped inside. Michael tried to consider what changed, grew bored with considering, and asked the room for a cigarette. One of the young men who'd been watching them was happy to oblige. Michael walked home from the party with a teenager nicknamed Maxipad, who looked dubious when Michael told him what his en English nickname actually meant. Maxie was tall, skeletal. He asked questions about places in New York Michael had never heard of. In the driveway when Michael went to say goodbye, Maxie kissed him. His jaw unhinged, his tongue moved over and under Michael's. The shock of what was happening was quickly replaced with a scraped out feeling in Michael's stomach. Maxie grabbed his hair, Michael pulled on Maxie's earlobes. Then Maxie stepped back. He let out a single hacking laugh. Michael wondered if he was being laughed at, realized he didn't care. He kissed Maxie again. Some part of Michael thought of his father, though he wasn't sure why. Probably because dad would have found this kiss disgusting or because he was too far away to know about Michael and the houses and the party he'd gone to or about the boy he'd kissed whose Adam's apple was identical to his nose. Walking inside, Michael was blinded by a flashlight's beam. For a moment, he was certain he was being robbed. But then he remembered Adela's newly hermetic existence and asked her, what did you see? I'm not playing, Adela answered. An actual question, he said, part of him hoping she'd seen that kiss that she found him disgusting or unrecognizable. With the flashlights scorching his eyes, Michael couldn't see the room they stood in. He wiggled his, wiggled his fingers through the beam. Aren't you gonna ask what I'm doing, he asked. When Adela didn't answer, he pushed his fingers into a beak and said shadow puppets. Michael hoped she'd laughed or tell him he was an idiot. But the only answer came from a skittering mouse and an overgrown shrub that tapped on their windows. Adela turned the flashlight off and Michael became differently blind. Thinking of, thinking of the short story she'd once read to him in which a dead man felt everything as he lay in his coffin, water dripping on his forehead, the snail's pace gro growth of his fingernails, 
But as it happened to Michael a dozen times in this new city, when fear came to claim him, something stood in its way. It was an actual question, Michael said. He stepped out of the living room and with hands for eyes walked upstairs. He found his room with surprising ease, lit the candles he'd melted on his windowsill until the whole place glowed. Lying on his sleeping bag, Michael thought of Maxie's mouth, Maxie's hand on his chin. Also how Ade American Adela would have kept the flashlight on his face as she explained to him exactly how he was being an asshole. Pause there, I think. Oh, I'm so glad that you read from that specific chapter um, because, you know, just to kick things off, I love this book. I love the characters, the setting. Uh, it just felt like the inside worlds of your characters and the external world of East Germany and Kritzhagen were so fully developed for me. And one of the most joyful parts for me as a reader was this liberation of Michael's, not just his sexuality, but his full personality. Right. And... As you've mentioned, Beata and uh, Adela have such a more frightened experience of Kritagen, probably what I would have felt if I were suddenly uprooted and mm -hmm. transported to this strange in transition place. Right. But Michael's perspective allows us a more ambiguous uh, understanding of how this kind of anarchy can be as liberating as it is terrifying. So I was really curious as you were writing this novel, because of how well-drawn this place is, the abandoned homes, but also the existing infrastructure that kind of lends this ghost town feeling to the place, like the right. one bar that's open, the public beach, like you don't expect there to still be um, infrastructure when you also see such uh, abandonment. So how did you decide to set your novel in this kind of in transition place and did that place shape what your novel ultimately became? I mean, very much so. I think the place was such an important part. I mean, was really in, a, in many ways was the starting off point for, for writing this novel. I was so, um, I was really fascinated um, by East Germany. Um, my mother, the, 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 the parts, my mother was actually born in East Germany and did defect when she was a child. And so that part is, um, true, and her family did leave a house behind. And so I just remember after the wall fell, this idea that people were returning and could return. It just was always a fascinating idea. So that was sort of um, the germ of the novel was about that. And then as I started to do research and sort of figure out where in the East, I thought it would, it made sense to take place. Then I was reading a lot about places on the, on the Baltic coast uh, where in particular, the population really shifted largely because they 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 had gone from being trade centers and the, and and the Volksmarine, which is the 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 navy that they, they had this hub there, and they were suddenly they didn't exist anymore. And so so I I kind of just love this idea of them moving to a place just as everyone else was leaving. And so I feel like that that contrast I I found found was really found really interesting. And then um so the so the the place I feel feels feels so I think I, I think in, in a way I figured out the place before I figured out the characters so um, because I was so interested in the setting and, and so excited by this idea of, of a ghost town and which which felt I don't think in the early draft I, I was conscious of this but thinking particularly about um, German history I feel like sort of the, the, the haunting quality I think was, was felt really interesting to explore as I was really revising the book. So, so yeah, so I, I, the place for me, I, I don't think, I don't think this book could have existed for me without the place. And then, um, and then Kritzhagen, I decided there were several places that it's, it's similar to, but I, I wanted to have a little bit of freedom. So Kritz, Kritzhagen is actually an invented place, but it's sort of, it's sort of um, model. There's a, there are two, um, there's a town called Vernamunda and then a city called Rostock and it's sort of it's sort of modeled on them and some of the historical events that happen there that I weave them into into this into the into the book in slightly different places but yeah so so place um and then I and then in, especially in early drafts I really I wrote way too much about the place because I was really fascinated <laughs> by it like I have some of my friends who were early readers said because especially Michael going into the houses I, I I wrote so because it was just really fascinating to me and also it was a really interesting way to to sort of understand him as a character so I had, I had so many scenes of him in houses and finally they're like we 
it's great for 12 pages, but not for 35. So I really, so it was, it was something I sort of fell in love with the place and the, and the, and I got so excited about creating all these details. So, so then eventually I had to really streamline it, but yeah, the place is really, um, was the, where, where I started, started this story. Yeah, absolutely. And it feels, you know, very much alive, I think, because so much of your interest and creativity is poured into it. And you could, you know, publish a travelogue just on this place (laughs) you've made up, I would read that. Um, And I loved all the abandoned houses that Michael explores, what you do have on the page. I mean, there's this one moment where he explores a house and ends up finding his, uh, his crush, Maxi Pad, just like sleeping on a bed that's like, just like a dirty mattress and like oh my god that was like probably a teenage dream of mine to just like wander into a house and find like my crush and in this place like in this kind of frightening playground that kind of magic can happen um but i wanted to return a bit to what you are speaking about in terms of um folding in germany's history uh, into this novel because I was really interested in how, for a book that is so involved with history Mm -hmm. and how larger political forces shape a place and the people in it, it felt like your characters had a lot of agency and the decisions that they make feel like actual choices rather than predestined paths that they were set on from the very start. So we have Beata defecting with her parents to West Germany. So she is sort of like forced into this moment, but then she makes this choice to pipe up when they're being interrogated and to to say a story of her own. And that choice really felt so alive to me. And that's kind of what I took. Mm -hmm. And Adela also similarly makes choices with the refugees who the you know, political forces have brought to Kritagen, makes a crucial decision when it, there's like a violent uh, attack that also feels like forces have created this violent storm. So you know, how did you think about maybe character agency uh, and decision-making fitting in with what is also like an epic sprawl of a multi-generational novel? Because usually those feel so like fate-driven, but this feels very choice-driven. That's such an interesting question. And I hadn't really thought of it in in those terms, but that really um, makes a lot of sense. And I I think I was both, I was really interested in, 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 in the history, but I, but, but I also, I like the I like the idea where they were sort of trying to exist almost separate from it, and then it kept sort of invading their lives, and it kept sort of they were like, oh, I want to do this, and then this thing would happen, and it would sort of move them in this direction, right? And so that happened several times, and so, so, um, so I was really like th- thinking a lot about how to um, how much of it is 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 about the is it a historical novel or is it a family novel in which there is th- there are these historical elements, and I think for me in a way. It was more the latter, and and what I really wanted was sort of the history to feel like it was almost like this presence that was almost sort of lurking in the background, and it sort of would sort of weave in and out at times, but it really felt like a story of this this family. So I was really, yeah, and I and so I for me I think the um the in the in the choices that they made and really and and it really it feels like it's interesting because I feel like it, it's true it isn't it doesn't feel like fate intervenes, and yet I also feel like there are moments where history sort of makes a choice for them. Like there's something that happens later with, with Michael t- towards the end. And I think in, in a lot of ways, because of his, he sort of has this, um, well, I don't think this gives much away, but like as an adult, he starts this bar, which is basically, it's called Secret Police. And it's basically sort of playing on these, the, the, the former history of, of um, where he lived. And I, I do think ultimately that, and the fact that he sort of, found humor in it so much and it didn't really take a lot of things seriously. I think then there were moments when, when history came and sort of reminded him of the serious. So I, seriousness. So I do think that, um, yeah, I was just really interested in creating them as, as fully realized characters with lots of agency. And then these moments where despite that agency, despite these choices that this, this force would sort of knock them off their feet for a second and or or their or even more than a second I think lots of things that happen really shift the family so I think so I was really interested in both it being like they just wanted to live their lives and yet history wouldn't totally let them do that yeah I think that's so smart because that feels like the lived experience of like 
moving through history, which is to say like moving through the present where you right. think of just making choices in your everyday life. And then like a historical force, a larger force comes and knocks you off your feet. And you yeah. recalibrate, you try and re, you know, get the control back in your daily life. And then of course that force comes, sweeps you again. And that feels very close to what it, I mean, just going through the pandemic, uh, you know, I yeah. make choices every day and then all of a sudden history comes without me realizing it's history and forces a total recalibration. Um, so I think what you're saying definitely rings true that even though they are, they feel to me like they are making these choices and they feel to themselves like they're making these choices, ultimately history is lurking, always ready to kind of knock them off of what they've built. Yeah. Uh, that's so interesting yeah and you know so glad that you brought up the secret police bar because I think okay. you know that's such um a fun but also uh like spiky part of this novel um mm -hmm. at a certain point you know something that is fun uh is there's a game that's kind of like a confession game um, yeah. that you know takes a dark turn and also a you know polite dinner conversation as soon as this bar is brought up it brings all of this extra weight that we didn't feel in Michael's perspective probably because yeah. he didn't have that history going in right um, and you know I think that your book tackles a lot of issues that you know might be just spiky for any writer to think about tackling like you have neo-nazism you mm -hmm. have the stigma around Romanian refugees the Stasi bar that we just mentioned. Right. But I'm always curious, which part of the novel did you actually find yourself most afraid to write? Sorry, most what to write, sorry. Most afraid to write. Um, I will, I think the moments where, where, where this definitely the section with the Romanian refugees um, I I both love that section, but I also I think it's so easy to turn moments like that into into cliche or into or it feels kind of like melodrama. And I was really so I think any of the really big moments, I think Baptist affection at the beginning and that, and then a moment of violence later. I think those are the three moments where the sort of the big events where I just I don't know. I was really I was really afraid of it sort of feeling overwrought. And so I think definitely. And I felt like the 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 section with the Romanian refugees, which was something that actually did happen in that region, and there was an attack, and yet um, a, a, a neo Nazis, there was this um, in these towns and cities when they had no space left, they were actually these campsites that these these makeshift campsites, and they were one was attacked. Um, but just making that feel real and. And as important as it was without sensationalizing it, but also without, 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 I mean, the melodrama, I was really afraid of the melody, you know, because I think violence is a really, a really hard thing to write. And then I think much later when I was um, in a much later revision of it, I was listening to a podcast. Um, it was an interview with, with Colm Toybean and someone had asked him how he writes violence. And he said something about how he really, in moments of violence, he really removes metaphor and, and figurative mm -hmm. language because it's it's because it's not about the metaphor; it's about the the actual experience. And I'm sure I didn't totally do that, but I, I remember going back and saying, "Okay, where am I? Where is the language too precious? Where is it? Where am I not really just showing what is happening?" Which I think for me was such a helpful moment in, in helping me figure out um, how to tackle that because I was definitely really worried about that and the and and the violence, but also yeah, and, and also just there are just so many so many pieces from having, I mean, sometimes it's interesting hearing people when they, when they present a synopsis and they're like neo-Nazis and I'm like, it's not like, I wanted it to actually be like, it's a plotty book, but I didn't want it to be like a plotty book. Like I wanted it to be more of like a family story where these plot elements, you know, came in. So, so yeah, any of the really big moments like that, but that one probably for me was the one I was most, and I, and I totally reworked it several times. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think it really resonates uh, with me, like the fear of melodrama or sentimentality yeah. um, and distracting from what's actually happening. And I think that makes sense of avoiding metaphor and preciousness because that kind of language slows down a moment. And there is something about violence that's like, it's really, it comes at you so quickly. There's right. such a shock to it. And I think that how you introduce one of the most violent 
actually like many of the violent moments is it does come out of nowhere. There isn't this sort of like da 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 like the Jaws theme song. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like it always uh, it tends to be a shock is um, how I often think about violent episodes. Um, but you know, I think that it's absolutely right that what I took from this book was the family and mm -hmm. its exploration. Um, and I thought that one of the really notable and impressive parts of your novel was how you resist this urge to clear up the family conflicts. I mean, some of the conflicts are addressed, but many mm -hmm. of the most deep seated issues like the core split between Adela and Michael when they move to Germany because mm -hmm. when they're in America, they're so close, they're like twins. Right. Um, and then as soon as they get to Kritzhagen, the division is so intense and as sudden, it's almost violent how sudden mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, something that I feel like is left still tangled and raw. Um, another relationship that Adela has with another character is also severed in a way that you know, is not ultimately touched. And I thought that the ability to show that conflict does, you know, even with time, even with 20, 30 years that pass can still be raw or buried um, was very much like how it is in life. But it also feels like a very difficult thing to do as a novelist. <laughs> like you want to tie up that loose end. So yeah. how did you resist that urge to tie up some of the the deepest conflicts? Um, well, I think first, I I think in earlier drafts, I maybe tried to tie them up a little bit too much. And then I was like, oh, this is, it just, I, you know, and it just felt, it felt trite or cliche or just didn't feel earned, right? And so um, I don't, ultimately I got really, I want, I, I was really interested in people who both love each other tremendously, but also have a lot of, anger and sadness toward each other, which I think is most complicated familial relationships that live in both places, right? And so, and I think because it was this multi-generational piece, I, I was able to sort of explore both moments where I felt like I was, I was really like leaning into a lot of tenderness they had for each other, but then, but then again, sort of these, the past and including history would sort of come in and like these, these small moments would suddenly trigger all these like remembrances of the past. So, um, so I think that was one way. I think an, another thing for me ultimately is when um, the book ends, um, Adela's son, Peter, it ends, it's in his, the last chapter is, is mostly close third on him and something about him and sort of, and, and this feels like sort of like, like that's where it feels like I was like leaning on like an old school novel trope where it's like you always end with like the youth, like the, the future, right? And, and I don't think, I wasn't trying to do it in some cheesy way, like everything, but I, but I feel like he, because he didn't have the same history, I think he could engage with the characters differently. And so I think that, especially his relationship with, with Beata, I felt like you got to see her beyond her children who had some, who both loved her, but resented her in a lot of ways, right? And so I think, so somehow like, that sort of created the change and it created the, not because I don't think it's a neat and tidy ending, but I think it allows, it allows an ending that for me felt a little hopeful, but also you saw something a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, that makes a lot of sense with the conversations we were having about like larger historical forces that there's also this personal history that lurks uh, and knocks people off center uh, just about as often. And with Peter not having the baggage of history, uh, mm -hmm. his relationship with his grandmother gets to come from like a blanker space. Um, right. And from a place where he's only known her when she is a very functional adult, right? He's only known her where um, like her children especially in the move to Germany like they experience her going through something that feels very traumatic and and for them kind of feels like an abandonment right and and I think that I think there's something interesting I think you know especially now that I'm older and I have a lot of friends who have kids and so I think suddenly like you see that's just like these small moments your the, the, their kids remember them forever and they, and how I think the parent-child relationship is such a is is so complicated and that and there's and there's there's always these layers of anger and frustration and I think especially 
the move and in the beginning I really I really did amp up sort of how they they all move in really different directions I think that's sort of the, the narrative the propulsion of the narrative really felt like the three of them get there and they all sort of have very different experiences and that sort of the, the sort of severing of them really happens there but I, I do think um yeah, he just he just sees her. He also sees Kritzhagen as like a very lovely place too, right? For the most part, ex um, except for the for one moment. So I think, it, and it's true. It's what's really wild is that those communities within a few years really went from being kind of ghost towns to being basically like the Jersey Shore of Northern Germany, right? So <laughs> not quite as maybe, but um, but so it just it suddenly it was just it was just like it was just family beachy thing. So I think he just sees it a lot more as that, and um, so that I feel like wrapped the book up nicely for me. Like I felt like by ending with him, I just think you could it sort of there was an automatic shift just by being in his perspective. Yeah, absolutely, and it also feel there isn't that neatness, um, that patness because the kind of familial issues that started with as early as Beatu and her parents kind of get carried forth as Peter then thinks about his relationship to Adela and Taro, his father, and how mm. that feeling of hurt and abandonment, um, the not yet ability to see one's parent as their own human being with their own emotional baggage right, carries right. forth with Peter, which is like also the kind of the poignancy and the, the rawness that we're left with, um, even as there's this wonderful hope uh, of a different kind of relationship. Yeah, it is, but I, you know, it is, it is hopeful, but it also, I don't feel like it's like, I, I hopefully it's not hopeful in a saccharine way. I think there's, I, I, I also feel like it ends with Peter sort of understanding maybe for the first time, a, a, sort of larger, the, the larger losses that will come to him at some point, particularly, you know, when he, when he's with her and he sort of suddenly, because he only sees her once a year, every year he sees like this slightly older person. And then this real realization, especially as she talks about the house and, um, and how it was in her family forever and ever, um, and tells it these stories of, of relatives from a few generations before. And she's like, I don't even know what they looked like or whatever. And then this realization that, that this is an experience that he will ultimately, people will essentially, he will be forgotten in a similar way too. And so I think, so I think there's like a melancholy at the end too, but I also, but at the same time with this real connection to her and trying to sort of, you know, really exist in that space with her for sure. Yeah. And actually this brings up something that I hadn't connected, which is, well, we meet most of your protagonists when they are teenagers. So kind of at the age where the expectation is, this is going to be a coming of age. Um, mm -hmm. Even Beata, the mother, we meet her when she's first 12 years yeah. old. Um, but in so many ways, it feels like it's really only Peter who gets the sort of more clear cut coming of age, the sense of like the veil dropping, him right. moving into that kind of adulthood where you realize, oh, life is lost. Um, and the first thing that I lose is my innocence. <laughs> but the other characters in some ways, because of those historical forces, because of those familial um, experiences, their coming of age feels not quite like Peter's. There's something that feels a little bit more like they were already adults when they were children. And therefore when they're adults, they feel maybe more stuck in that. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if you thought about like coming of age for them. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. And um, for me, there was something, it's true that I think um, we meet Beata and Adele and Michael when they're all, the first time we ever see them, they're all of a similar age. And I think with the three of them in particular, there was this, this idea of sort of children sort of essentially raising themselves that I was really fascinated by. I think um, uh, Beata was born to, older, significantly older parents. And she finds out through her cousin that she was a mistake. And like always this sense, then they were these intellectuals who sort of sort of saw her as this imposition. And then especially once they left East Germany and then they, 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 they sort of kept wandering until they ended up at, in the middle of the Midwest, right? And, and so there she is with these parents who barely speak English and she is living this whole life that they have no not that they don't know about, but they have no real interest in either. So she really is raising herself. And then I think, so I, so I think even the, and even, and even the, the way they defect is it's very much, she doesn't know they're defecting until they're in the train station bathroom and her, like the mom brings her into a stall, flushes the toilet and hands her a passport. Right. And so this, this sense that they just almost, they, they I think the three of them at times feel like afterthoughts. And I don't think 
And I definitely don't think that's true. Um, but I think that's the sense that's how they feel. And then the, 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 the first Michael and Adela chapters, they are really, um, like Michael is going into these houses that work that people have left to sort of find old furniture and things basically because Beata is so overwhelmed by the move that she kind of shuts down. And so he de decorates the house with crappy old furniture. Right. And then, um, so I, I think, you, and then Adela just starts retreating and she's like brought all these library books from the States with her. And she's reading about anything that she can about this new place she's moved to, to try and figure out. And so I, they just, they don't feel like they have adults to lean on. And so I think, yeah, they're coming of age they're coming from a place where they already kind of feel like they're taking care of themselves. And whereas Peter, and I think Adela as a mother, particularly until she returns later, I think she, her, her parenting of Peter is very much like she is very present. I think it's almost a response to sort of the having felt like she was sort of left alone as a kid. And so, um, and then I think when she comes back to Kritzhagen and after she's been there for a while, she has this realization that she's sort of like, gone to that same behavior but it's also different for Peter because he has his grandmother in there and he's uncle so he has this whole support system so so I think the the three main characters though their, their adolescence were one of real just figuring their own stuff out right and um so I think definitely that's why it, for me it feels different yeah absolutely because in so many ways they can't really be thinking about um the more existential questions when the very question of survival is still uh, up for grabs, right? They, wh yeah. What are we gonna eat? Where's the electricity? <laughs> what are we gonna right. see? <laughs> oh, and I think, you know, I love how you touched on the ways in which um, your characters found ways to cope with difficult situations, how they all have these different coping mechanisms. Beata sleeps, Adela reads about German atrocities, um, Michael swims, and then later, you know, um, you know, has sex and romances that kind of allow him to maybe detach from difficult emotions. Yeah. And I wondered if, you know, because it was such a unique way for me to find the key to the characters, um, what, were these coping mechanisms a way for you to find your way into these characters or was there a different entry point for them? I mean, yeah, I think that's, um... Yes, for sure. I think um, because I was trying to, as I was figuring them out, I also wanted to, I wanted them to all feel different, right? And so, um, so, so yeah. So the, so their actions very much became a way I understood them. And Michael, like, sort of as a character who this this move sort of it's true he has to sort of figure a lot of things out, but he also in sort of quickly finding this sort of these wannabe anarchists, the, the, these sort of joyful, you know you know, low grade, like they're like a little, like they think they're like hoodlums and stuff, but they're really, I mean, it's a super teenage stuff, but he really finds a lot of joy, a lot of excitement, a lot of connection. And so I think, um, so he, his actions for me had to be much more outward. Whereas, whereas in the beginning, and it changes eventually, but in the beginning, Beata and Adela are much, they stay much closer to home. And the only time Beata leaves is when she does these weird walks in the middle of the night and ends up in this bar with all these old men, which again, sort of still feels like, Sort of sadness and history kind of like hangs out with her even when she even when she's like being social whereas like so i so i and 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 the the adela piece reading like she was a character um it took me a while to figure out and then i have a a, a friend um who's a was a reader and, and really early draft and she she there, there were certain moments i think because i was so afraid of like putting the history in so much that it felt like a history book as opposed to a novel that she, she, she felt like there wasn't, like she, she was like, you need to make this, if it's about Germany, it has to be about Germany specifically, not sort of incidentally. And so in saying that, then I was like, well, then who's going to really sort of unearth that history. And then, and then Adela that gave her the reading and gave her something to do. And then through that, I really understood sort of this need to understand and control. Um, and, and, but also I had a lot of empathy for her because she was terribly afraid and then she's moving to this place and she's reading about it. And then around her, she's in this weird old house that's falling apart with no electricity. And it feels like what she's reading about is coming true, right? So, um, so yeah, the, the, those actions really were really important in, in sort of figuring out those characters for sure. Yeah, I think that 
basically I'm going to steal that for what I'm writing now is I'm going to try and find <laughs> the patterns of behavior that each of my characters has. And that will be my entry point. <laughs> well, that is awesome. <laughs> in some ways, like that is what makes people their most predictable is what they choose to do, what rather what they end up doing when um, they're at their most emotional or when things are most difficult. It, it is sort of like you kind of just click back into a habit, a routine. Um, and I'd never considered that until I read your book. So that was very cool to see. Oh, well, thank you. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I have another question, but I also want to just uh, cue people up that I'm going to be opening to audience questions uh, shortly. So if you haven't already started typing into the Q&A, you can go ahead and do so. Um, and then John will read out uh, the questions. But um, what I wanted to end on, uh, at least for now, was we haven't yet mentioned an amazing character you have, uh, the cousin, is it Udo? Udo, yeah. Udo, so compelling. He kind of shows up almost like a fairy godmother, right when Adela is kind of at the deepest part of her hermit pit mm -hmm. and essentially just, you know, transports her out, takes her to the beach, gets her a bike. He's described as this kind of giant, almost Frankenstein monster looking right. guy with such kindness and seemingly such goodness and patience. But he did also seem to embody uh, an aspect of, of German history. Uh, you know, he is very um, touchy about Adela's interest in German history, uh, Germany's history. And as time passes, you complicate his goodness and his role in this family's life. And so I wanted just to hear you talk a little bit about how, you know, what Udo meant to you uh, as you were writing him. Yeah, I mean, initially it was more just I... At some point, especially because the beginning is kind of bleak, especially for Beata and Adela, and I knew, and I, and I knew that some sort of outside force had to, had to sort of come in to sort of, to sort of shift things. And then, just intuitively, it made sense that it was another teenager as opposed to an adult, because then again, it, there's there's there because he shows up, I think a solid week or two before his mother actually appears. Like so they so again it's like it's so again he's like this giant you know bear, he's like he's like speaks very little and but but again his actions really show yeah a lot of goodness and really and he and really um suddenly Adela sees a way out of what she's been stuck in through him and yeah and I did it was funny because I had a I had a lot of love for him and then it's that thing where you have to make characters you love do crappy things to make fiction happen right and then oh. but it also I, I think um was was necessary I mean I think I was really, I really tried to think of him first as a, as a character and, and really as a, in a way, as a foil to, to, to Michael and Adela, who, um, who are much both more verbal, but a lot, they have sort of like an, an anger and a frustration that lives much more on the surface. Whereas for him, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't really see it for a long time. And then I think as I was writing him in revision, I started to think more about how um, in talking to, to relatives in um, Germany and friends, um, really um, all of, like in West Germany after the war, you learned about like German in school, like you learned about what the Germans did. Like it was, it was really almost like, it was like a toning through just fully like seeing what the atrocities you've done and facing them. It was very, it was like this very, like, we did this awful thing. We can never do it again. In East Germany, they were like, no, we're kind of part of Russia. So like, so they didn't really, they didn't really learn the history in the same way that in West Germany, you, they really had to do a lot of atoning for the, the incredibly awful things that happened during World War II, right? But um, so I think in a way he became sort of an example of that he's like oh no we're not that we were sort of this and we've just we've come back to you know but we were like that wasn't really us even though it was and so i think that's a really interesting thing that i didn't learn until later in talking to people but then sort of became he sort of embodied that in a certain way yeah i didn't um know that side of like how it sort of split but it makes he basically embodies that really really well um, mm. And it's interesting to think of maybe an analogy to how the North thinks about, uh, rather North uh, parts of America think about the history of enslaved people versus the South and the ways in which there's a distancing, an attempt to distance. Um, For sure, yeah, I think that's, it, that's a, yeah, that's a perfect connection, yeah, totally. Uh, 
So with that, I have, as you know, many pages of questions, but I will throw it over to John uh, to give other people a chance. We don't have any uh, questions so far. If, if folks would like to submit their questions, they're welcome to do so using the Q&A. But Lillian, if you want to dive deeper into your pages of questions, uh, I would be excited to hear that. Um, I think we have time for about two more and I'll, I'll come back on um, either if there's more or, or well, when it's time to, to wrap up. Yeah, cool. great. So um, something that we also didn't touch on was just the sheer amount of time that passes in this novel, um, almost 50 years from 1968 to 2016. Mm -hmm. And it's so enjoyable when uh, a, a novelist can wield time as well as you do, um, because we get to see the characters not just grow old, but also grow young. Mm -hmm. You really have a blank check when it comes to what direction time moves in. But that right. also seems terrifying from like the writer point of view because you <laughs> have a blank check. So how did you decide what to show when in the novel? Um, like what was that process like? Yeah, I mean, it took, it, it, this was not a linear or neat process to write. I will, it was a, it was a lot of just trying things out. Um, I realized after the first draft that, um, because I was really interested in in showing some of Beata's life between when she defects to when she meets Paul, who ends up uh, her, being her husband and the father of, of Adele and Michael. But I was sort of in the early draft, I think I was trying to weave this backstory into, into, into the chapters and the sort of the present of it. And it just was really clunky. And so then I started, I had this idea of like, what if I sort of just pull them out and they're like these discrete chapters. And then they also almost become like a little bit of a breath between the, the bigger sections of the, of the, of the, of that story. So then I, that made my life a lot easier in terms of that. And, and even with that, I wrote a couple that I ended up not using, but cause I was just in, Ultimately, I feel like I, I got to know them really well. And so even if there was there was some that I didn't end up using, it's still, I had a real sense of them that I think hopefully, you know, those details that resonated in, in the way I was able to write them in the, in the pages that were still there. And then um, it was really a novel of subtraction in that I, um, because I had this really, this, this really interesting world that I was writing about that I was sort of creating that I loved and there were so many other characters in the early draft. The father was a bigger character in the early draft when Adela leaves for a while, like there was a section about the initial leaving that ultimately I think again was useful for me, but narratively slowed it down. So it was really, the whole thing was a lot of cutting. So it was a lot of <laughs> writing way more than I needed to. And um, so, which is, I don't recommend that necessarily as a, as a way to write, but um, but then ultimately I started to, to realize sort of what, which pieces were most important and which pieces to keep. And even one, there was one whole chapter that um, my editor and I decided to cut and he and I were both like the writing in here, is, it's some of the, like, it's like some of my favorite writing in the book. And he's like, mine too. He's like, but narratively it, 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 we don't need it. And I was like, that is also true. So, so ultimately I had to, I had to be a little just like kill your darlings in that way and, and cut certain things I didn't want to. Um, but yeah. And then I, I and for me, that there was just something about, um, always I wanted the story to, to, to have, a, I always very early on, I think even the first draft ending with Peter was where I knew I wanted to end there. So, I, so it always had that. So I don't know why exactly, but I just think for me, I guess time as a character was really interesting for me. And I think, um, so that's why it became such a, that's why the, the time span was so long. It just was all, like, I could have very easily written just there, like three months, first three months in Kritzhagen, there's a lot, to, but I, but I also loved the way that place changed so much. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like, and that shape changed them. And so, so that's why the time piece became sort of so extended. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that another really marvelous part about how you use time is because you have, you introduce us to your main protagonists when they're teenagers at that period when people are really just playing with versions of who they might be. Mm -hmm. We get to see essentially the aging process of, okay, here are all the breath of their personality. Now let's see like what parts soften, what parts grow more rigid. And I feel like yeah. there's such a element of like surprise and also satisfaction to seeing like, oh, so Adela's desire to do good becomes more and more rigid to a point where it becomes almost destructive to her. Like that is such an interesting way to play it. But I guess my, maybe my last question for the yeah. night 
um, is could you talk a little bit about that process of, you know, having to not just figure out your character's personalities as teenagers, but what parts of their personalities you want to carry forth as they grew to 30, 40, 50 years old? Yeah. Um, I mean, that was actually really fun. And it felt to me why I, I, I in a certain way, I, I, I felt like I could have tinkered with this book for many years more because I just sort of playing with sort of where they ended up. Um, it was, you know, a sort of taking different elements. Right. It's true. Like Adela's goodness, like it's um, like in an interesting way, I think she is the moral center of this book. She's the one who is the, is actually the, if, you, if, if, we, if we're doing a scale of who's the good person in the book, it's, but also like, it is like, there's also, there's also this, there, there's also, it is pretty intense her, you know, the, the, because she's, she sees the world in, with, with this justice lens and this, uh, there's also this intensity to her, which I think is both amazing, but um, so, so then ultimately, and there was a lot of brainstorming, like where would she end up because of that? And then, so where she ends up just before she comes back is in a very different part of the world, you know, and, and, and doing really trying to engage in really meaningful work. And then the same with Michael, I felt like his sort of exuberance, like then, and sort of the, the way that he sort of sees everything as a joke, um, then the bar as a joke almost like sort of made sense and all, but also like it like sort of his, it really connected to the, sort of the exuberance that, that, that you saw in him as like a 14, 15 and 16 year old. And so, so it was a lot of, um, it was just a lot of like thinking of different ideas, but ultimately when the, when the right idea came, it was just like, oh, that's it. And that was really exciting. But there were several times where I would have something in, in there. It's just like, oh, that could be it. And I'm like, well, let's try that. And then like, I'd come up with a better idea. Like, oh, that, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, it was like shake the magic eight ball again and see like- what Exactly. <laughs> yes. We do have one question from, from the audience. Okay. Um, I think we have time for before we wrap up. Uh, two, we'll say it's a two part question. It's the same. Same viewer ask, asking two questions here. Um, and the first is, how do you think the recent East would be received in Germany? And also what's next for you as a writer? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm actually really curious about the first question. Um, um, so I, towards the end, hired a, a German writer and a, a, a historical writer to do like a German fact check of the book. Um, Cause as much as I had done research and as much as I spent time there as a, as a child, um, I just, there were things I was gonna miss. So I, so hopefully, I mean, I've also heard that Germans are very suspicious of outsiders writing about their country, even though my mom was, lived there until she was in her twenties and I, um, but still I'm very much an American with, with you know, some German ancestry and family there. But so, so I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, the Germans I know who have read it have responded to it. And so, but that's, we will see. So that, that first one, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure, but hopeful um, and nervous because, you know, um, all my German relatives are amazing, but they're very intense. And I was like, I was like, oh, they're an intense group of readers, I bet, just if they're anything like my family in Germany. And then the other one, I'm working on a new book, very different. Um, first person takes place over a few months because I just, I, it was like almost like a palate cleanser. I was like, no third person, no, no 50 year span. So um, it's, I mean, I'm maybe like three quarters of the way through a very rough first draft. Um, um, but that's, yeah, so I'm, that's what I'm doing next. Well, we hope we can have you in the bookstore for oh, yes. the next one. Um, and, um, but Thomas Gratton and Lillian Lee, thank you so much for joining us this evening at At Home with Literati. Um, yeah, definitely hope to have you in the store for book I two. Love that. Um, but until then, we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our viewers, we hope you stay safe and be well as well. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. So take care everybody and have a great night. Thanks, John. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah. Bye, all.